Hello, hello. Today we will have a short uh, chat with Michel Gong, who is uh, head of the division of critical care medicine at the Montefiore Hospital in New York, in the US, of course. And uh, she is also a professor at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. And uh, we, we are discussing with her uh, in part because uh, she is one of the investigators of the Victas study, which just came out uh, a few hours ago uh, in the JAMA. And it's an interesting study that deserves some, uh, some comments. So my first question, Michel, if we focus on vitamin C plus B plus hydrocortisone as a cocktail, I would like to ask you what the background is and the rationale, please. Yeah, so, um... You know, this this is one of those trials that came out because actually there, there was already a change in some people's practice towards a, um, a resuscitation and shock that didn't actually have a lot of great foundation in terms of effectiveness. So there has been actually a previous publication that was purely observational that had looked at this cocktail of thiamine, vitamin C, um, and hydrocortisone in patients with septic shock and led to a lot of press, which is one thing that we're dealing more with now in, in medicine, right? The, the social media and the hype seemed to indicate that it was a cure for sepsis. And I'm not using that word lightly because actually that was the, the terminology is used. And we in practice were seeing actually some of the downfalls. Downfalls such as actually a patient that we had actually here in Montefiore who refused surgery for toxic megacolon because they would have opted for high dose vitamin C and hydrocortisone and thiamine instead. So instead of proven therapy to what that was hyped, but this was observational. So it's not just the Victus. There were actually several other groups around the same time that actually had decided to conduct a large randomized control trials and various funding agencies to look at the um, clinical efficacy of this cocktail in sepsis. Yeah, and so indeed uh, there are at least three large trials um, actually published also in the, in the JAMA. Uh, and um, is it possible to put them all together or are we looking at somewhat different aspects? No, I, I think actually for a large part, many of these trials could be combined into a, a meta-analysis. And that's actually one lesson that we should learn from COVID, okay? You know, prior to COVID, because of funding, you know, mechanics and so forth, it wasn't always easy to be able to join forces with different groups and even in different countries, right? To be able to do rapid, large scale trials to get an answer very quickly. So Victus is actually one example of how different trials, you know, we're all similarly studying different th the same thing, slight differences, like some without hydrocortisone, some with, and some, you know, slightly different patient population, but they were all very similar in that sense. Um, but they were all done separately. In COVID, we've seen with multi-platform trials like Remap Recovery with the Active yeah, yeah. 4 a much, much greater ability for collaboration with our international colleagues. Yeah, but uh, the, um, the vitamin study did not compare the cocktail to nothing because all patients received corticosteroids. It was a study on vitamins. And the CITRIS ALI study was on patients with ALI. And that study gave some uh, results which are difficult to interpret. There was uh, no difference in SOFA score, but perhaps a difference in mortality. And actually we wrote a letter in the JAMA indicating they, they didn't take the mortality well into account in the calculation of yep. the SOFA scores. Uh, there was a problem there. So they may not be all so easily combined, could they? And I would also add, okay, that the doses of vitamin C was very different. Ah, uh, yeah, very good. Okay. The dose so of let's, vitamin C, yeah. So let's and, go in. Let's go into your uh, your trial, and uh, if you don't mind summarizing uh, 
this uh, Victas uh, trial uh, in a few words, we would appreciate. Sure. So this was a randomized control trial targeting patients with sepsis. Um, so they have to show some signs of either hypotension or organ failure and, and for severe sepsis. And they will randomize to either um, a, the cocktail of thiamine, vitamin C, and hydrocortisone versus actually the control group. Now, patients, however, could have hydrocortisone in either of those groups, and a large number of the patients ended up having it. Um, after about 501 patients, enrollment was stopped, and we can talk about that a little bit later about why. Um, and in essence, the results show that there was no difference in terms of a ventilator and vasopressor free days um, and between the two groups. And actually, if you look at it, the intervention group was actually slightly a little bit worse. And several sensitivity analysis looking at time to treatment, it's like too early, too late, um, didn't show any differences in terms of the outcomes uh, with regards to the intervention. Um, oh, and this yeah. is not, this is actually consistent with at least three of the previous trials that has come out in the last year, um, looking at actually vitamin C um, plus an environment in uh, in this population. So, well, first of all, I'd like to ask you. It's a cocktail, as you mentioned. And is any component of the cocktail more important than the others? Is it primarily the addition of the vitamin C to the hydrocortisone or vice versa? Or, or, or is it really a cocktail which is needed? That's an excellent question. So there is definitely um, some you know, preliminary preclinical evidence to show that actually maybe the combination of the hydroxy uh, of uh, hydrocortisone with the vitamin C and the thiamine can have an additive effect and reduce actually the side effects of um, the vitamin C, especially at higher doses on like renal failure. However, okay, we actually heavily debated this issue at the start of the design of this trial because. Many of us actually thought, well, maybe we should figure out if hydrocortisone, for example, should be separated out, okay? And see, actually, maybe this is just a hydrocortisone effect, which, you know, we already have good data that in shock, it can be some beneficial in certain subsets of patients. But ultimately, it wasn't actually done because there are certain limits with how many patients we can examine under the current debt funding mechanism. Sure. And to be able to separate it into three groups was going to, in all likelihood, uh, made the trial in feasible, unfeasible, and to be able to get an answer. So it became came down to a two arm trial, okay, in which you're right, we cannot separate actually whether. No, or not but if the trial had been positive, you could perhaps consider that this is one component versus the other, but if the cocktail, it does not result in exactly. any beneficial effect. There is a recent meta-analysis, uh, which is quite good from Germany, just published in Critical Care on vitamin C in sepsis. And they found 17 trials and uh, with some promising results, but uh, mm -hmm. that's all we can say now. Because my question is, where do we go from there? <laughs> is it a nail in the coffin or is it just one piece and we need further trials? Uh, and what do you recommend to the practicing physicians? Yeah, so I, I think it's a good question. I, I would not recommend the cocktail that we have, okay? However, do I think it's the nail in the coffin? I don't know that I am completely ready to say that. I will say actually I we're done with the trials that we have done as such. However, is there still room for certain things? And certain things are actually high dose vitamin C and perhaps actually a personalized medicine approach is that do we have markers right now that might indicate to us that there are certain patient population that would more benefit from having the high vitamin C, uh -huh. right? Do, do, um, do, do you think we should measure the vitamin C levels in patients? So 
my issue is, is that I don't know that vitamin C level is the answer. We know that from vitamin D studies, right? So we have known from our randomized controlled trials and vitamin D studies that initially they thought, okay, maybe the lower vitamin D levels are the ones that we should be targeting. But subsequent to that, subsequent trials have shown targeting those patients with the low vitamin D levels undoubtedly did target patients who have worse outcomes but they didn't benefit from just having the vitamin exactly. D repletion. Exactly. So just the vitamin level itself, I'm not convinced is the biomarker that we need to indicate to us who are the more responsive. What we're still struggling with in clinical trials and critical illness is looking for mechanistic biomarkers that can be predictive. So predictive biomarkers of who are better able to respond. So Markers of, say, because it's given vitamin C, higher degree of reactive, you know, uh, oxygen injury. How do we identify those patients who then therefore may be better targeted with a high dose vitamin C levels? And I don't know yet that we have the answer to that. So you think that that's what we should do next and try to set the stage yeah. for so another I, trial? So I am open to say a higher dose vitamin C trial, but I would really like to see that trial be paired off with either a personalized approach in terms of understanding who are better able to um, respond to it, either right off the bat in terms of recruitment and enrollment study, or a pre-planned um, a priori analysis of known subgroups that we think, because sometimes some of our analysis takes too long and you just can't wait with sepsis, right? But it's got to be pre-planned so that we understand actually which patients are going to be a better candidate and more responsive and who to use the drug on. Okay. And that is the next step, I think, in critical illness, clinical yeah. trial. The Victa study was stopped before the planned end, but as we say, the results are totally negative. So personally, I'm yeah. not so sure that we need to continue in that direction. But hopefully <laughs> you will get the big grant to continue and ask the, um, the very good questions as indeed there are still a lot of things to explore, right? Yeah, and uh, you know, there are, you know, in, in addition, I, 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 I would like to actually look at other agents other than just vitamins, you know, as a host. Um, but yeah. personally, I've always been a lot more interested in interventions that um, can actually change how we manage patients. So, yeah. you know, so, uh, you know, even simple questions of things that we do every day, like how we resuscitate the patients, right? Yeah, um, sure. What kind of physiological markers can actually have the most impact in terms of understanding response to fluid resuscitation and outcomes, right? As well as actually things of like when to start pressors because there's huge practice variability. This is something we do every day, all of us do. But I guarantee you that my practice can completely be different in terms of timing when I would start a presser compared to my next colleague, my next colleague, my next colleague. Yes. There's so much variations in that. And some of us are more fluid, you know, um, affinity. So we tend to give a lot more fluids. And some of us are actually a lot more um, uh, fluid restrictive. So we plan, to, we stop pressers much earlier. Absolutely, that, yeah. Right? And that simple question that we deal with every single day hasn't actually been adequately studied to see how we should be doing it. And there are many more questions, uh, Michelle. I'm, I'm afraid our time is up now, but we will be very pleased to continue this discussion with you and of course with others as well. So thank you very, very much. And um, we enjoyed this conversation and we learned a lot. Thank you, take care. Thank you for the invitation. And it's always a pleasure to speak with you, Jean-Louis. Take care. Thank you.